Hey everyone, welcome to the channel! February is over and it's undeniably been another great month for emulation. We've seen major accomplishments from the developers behind some of the emulators for current gen consoles, and the teams behind other modern emulators haven't shown any signs of slowing down either. There's been a lot to keep up with, so this video is a closer look at a few of the more notable updates that some of these emulators have received over the last month. I'll do my best to keep things brief, so if you notice that I left out something important, or you have something else to add, feel free to drop a comment below. While you're down there, you'll find timestamps in the description, as well as links to all of these emulators and their Patreon pages, so that you can try them out and support the people behind them if you'd like. And of course, be sure to hit that subscribe button if you want to keep on seeing more videos from me. Let's kick things off with Xbox emulation and CXBX Reloaded since I missed it in my last recap. Back in January, the team behind this emulator rolled out some big changes to how audio was handled, fixing audio issues in a number of games like Guilty Gear X2, and bringing some games such as Group S Challenge and 007 Nightfire in-game for the first time. The developers continued building on these updates in February, solving a create sound buffer error that caused crashes in a number of titles. Thanks to this, games like Defender which threw this error when launched are now able to boot properly. This last month also saw some changes to how shaders are handled, which provides a huge performance boost in some games when they're first booted up in compiling shaders, as well as smoothing out games like Azuric, which repeatedly compile shaders throughout gameplay. In addition to this, a small fix to some code resulted in some big rendering improvements in a few games such as Baldur's Gate Dark Alliance, and better performance in a few other games such as Blood Rain 2. Looking at Xbox 360 emulation, a new set of instructions was implemented in Xenia last month, allowing Telltale games such as Batman and The Walking Dead to boot in-game, although they're not quite totally stable yet. There were also some adjustments made to MIP mapping that fixed a particular crash in Techland games and makes Dead Island playable, although Techland games in general seem to have issues rendering without ROV, so users of AMD GPUs won't see much improvement in these games just yet. Forza Horizon 2 and potentially other games have seen some major benefits to a fix in the way this emulator handles some unique arithmetic. Since this update, both collision detection and a crash within the emulator have totally been fixed in Forza Horizon 2, making this game much more playable despite some graphical glitches and dips in the frame rate. The Canary build of Xenia also got some new features last month such as an auto check for updates as well as SDL input. So if you have the library and configuration file set up, many third party controllers can be used with this emulator without any additional software like X360E. Moving into the realm of PlayStation emulation, you may have seen the headlines earlier this month when the PlayStation 4 emulator GPCS4 reached a major milestone by going in-game for the first time with the arcade style shooter We Are Doomed. Needless to say, the simulator is still in its very early stages, so it does take a little bit of work in Visual Studio to launch the game. And when you do, you'll be greeted with a low frame rate and no controller support aside from the keyboard. Nonetheless, this is a huge accomplishment and the GPCS4 team are hard at work getting a 3D game working on this emulator as well, with Nier Automata in their sights. I expect it'll be a long time before we see many games running on GPCS4, but it's very impressive to see progress like this in an emulator for a current gen console. Looking at PlayStation 3 emulation, this month has kept the RPCS3 developers on their toes fixing a number of regressions and really polishing up some recent changes to this emulator. One long-standing regression that was fixed was a driver-related issue with some AMD graphics cards, which caused some visual artifacts in quite a few games such as Gatling Gears and Class of Heroes 2G. Early in February, we also saw some texture fixes for Heavy Rain and possibly other games as well thanks to a fix to how right color buffers works. Along with these texture fixes, we also saw an update that further cleans up how Z-Culling is handled in this emulator, which solves an issue with lighting effects showing up through walls in some games like Alien Isolation. This month also saw a fix for a handful of games where characters used to spawn out of bounds or fall through scenery. Some notable examples of this are Ratchet & Clank, Tools of Destruction, and Quest for Booty, where Ratchet no longer falls through the map. While these games still aren't quite stable enough to be considered playable just yet, this update does make it much easier to progress through both of them. And on top of all of this, you'll find lots of minor updates and behind the scenes fixes to the X-Audio and OpenGL backends, as well as the addition of proper multi-language support to the native UI within this emulator. Nintendo Switch emulation also saw a ton of improvements this last month with the developers of Ryujinx kicking things off by continuing to build on January's OpenGL overhaul. 
One piece of this came right at the end of January when stencil texturing was enabled, allowing Xenoblade Chronicles 2 to render much better than before, although it's worth mentioning that this game is still fairly unstable overall. Another piece of this came with some fixes to the GL renderer which solved some crashes and other issues when exiting out of a game. And to top things off, most of the A32 instruction set was added to Reajinx which is required by many games. So far a few games like Captain Toad Treasure Tracker are now in game and the developers are hard at work implementing the rest of this instruction set so that even more games will be up and running. In fact Mario Kart 8 is in game as of early March but I'll touch on that a bit more in the next recap. As we move further into Nintendo emulation, I just want to make a quick note that I'll be looking exclusively at the free-to-play versions of the next couple of emulators. Some of these updates have been in early access builds for quite a while, but I want to focus on what's available for everyone. Still looking at Switch emulation, the team behind Yuzu also started February out on a strong note by merging the Vulkan API from the early access builds into the mainline build. This graphics backend provides a general boost in performance and render quality to the majority of games running on this emulator, with some exceptions like Pokemon Sword and Shield. Thanks to this update, this emulator is much more usable on lower end systems, as well as AMD GPUs in general due to their poor OpenGL support. It's worth mentioning that this is still a work in progress and some games will crash using Vulkan, but on the flip side using it fixes many issues such as the graphical glitches in Link's Awakening and the audio related stuttering in Super Mario Odyssey. In fact, the stuttering was also eliminated in OpenGL last month, so this emulator is running much smoother in general no matter which graphics backend you're using. There have also been some changes to stencil functions in this emulator which fix a number of graphical issues in games such as Cadence of Hyrule and Oninaki. Several other games have seen improvements too such as Kirby Star Allies which is running very well thanks to some changes to how shaders are handled by the Vulkan backend, although you can still expect some occasional crashes, dips in the frame rate, and graphical glitches in a select few areas. Splatoon 2 has also become quite playable because your inkling can now swim in ink thanks to an update that improves how this emulator handles queries from the GPU. There are still some graphical issues and you need to turn async off to swim up walls and prevent a couple of soft locks. So although performance takes a dive in some areas, you can now enjoy the offline version of this game on Yuzu. And last but not least, the Wii U emulator Simu saw some awesome updates last month starting with some more improvements to the Vulkan backend in version 1.17.1. These changes fixed some prominent crashes and memory leaks and reduced VRAM use in general, which eliminates the performance loss that used to occur while playing a game for an extended period of time, although some games do still suffer from unique memory leaks. Version 1.17.2 brought along more bug fixes and some big improvements to the multi-core recompiler, making it much more stable and usable in general. And while it's still not compatible with every game, the latest update to this feature makes it work properly with many popular titles like Mario Kart and Smash, making it a very useful tool for both demanding games and lower-end systems. In addition, some changes were also made to how the PowerPC processor is emulated, fixing crashes in games such as Paper Mario Color Splash. You'll also now see the addition of a debug option in the settings, as well as a few minor updates to the UI that have fixed your games list and removed a few options that are no longer necessary. So that's a brief wrap up of what we've seen in emulation throughout February. Again, a ton has happened this last month, so if you noticed that I left out anything important or it didn't include an emulator that you wanted to see, leave a comment below so that it doesn't get missed. And if you enjoyed this recap and you want to see more from me in the future, be sure to give this video a like and hit that subscribe button. And as always, thanks for watching, and I'll catch you in the next one.